Welcome back. You're still watching Fin Week Money Matters. Remember, this is the show that helps you manage your finances. Now, what started off as a nuisance to shoppers has now become one of the most effective promotional campaigns in local retail history. Stickies has had parents and guardians succumbing to the pestering power of their children and purchased more items than usual to make the 150 rand quota for these novelty toys. But is the marketing gimmick enough to turn around the company's losing streak? Shrinking market share and increasing costs are only some of the recent battles that this retailer is faced with. But joining us to discuss pick and pay's turnaround strategy are retail analysts Alec Abram from Sassfin Bank and Chris Gilmore from APSA Wealth and Investment Management. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Alec, let me start with you. I don't know if you've got any children, but I stickies, do. is it working? Is this uh, the biggest uh, you know, the retail gimmick that's worked? Um, you know, it, it's, it's yet another marketing campaign. Retailers have marketing campaigns all of the time. And uh, this one seems to have been uh, a little bit more exciting for the kids. Um, but uh, I, m I must say, uh, my kids haven't uh, caught, uh, caught on to it yet. So, uh, yeah, I think maybe um, a lot more uh, being done about it than, uh, uh, than, than, than we believe. Mm. Chris, let me come to you with uh, you know, these retail gimmicks or loyalty uh, card spurs out with their numbers and that 20 rand breakfast that everybody's been raving about. Do these work, these loyalty programs and these gimmicks, all to get the consumer excited? They do. And I mean, you mentioned Spur, and this morning Pierre from Tonder told us, Alec was at the presentation as well, that you spend a thousand rand at Spur, you get, a 50, you get 50 rands back. So it's what, 5% of, is my arithmetic correct? Okay. Um, it's not an awful lot, but it, I think it's enough. And it's strange psychologically how these, these, these promotions actually work. I mean, I know very, very wealthy people who get so upset if they leave their loyalty card in, in, in the car and they don't get their points. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amazing. So I think over many decades, many retailers have found that um, the psychological pool that these loyalty programs have got is, is quite immense. And the stickies thing, um, we were talking off air earlier, and it's, it's amazing. I, I would never have thought this thing would have taken off. And you look at in Europe uh, with, with Lidl, for example, it didn't take off that well. Um, and maybe it's because of the demographics. We've got a much, much younger population in South Africa than they have in Europe. Hmm. Well, now, let's move our focus back to uh, pick and pay <coughs> as a whole. Uh, just, Alec, where do you stand when you look at pick and pay? Has it been able to, to do this turnaround strategy? Do you feel like it's on track? Yes, they've done, they've done a lot of good work. Um, I think a lot of that has accelerated with the uh, arrival of Richard Brasher. Um, they've done work in terms of uh, cutting down their costs, in terms of category buying, um, uh, consolidating their procurement infrastructure. So they've done a lot of good work. However, I think you will really see a turnaround in profitability of that business when they sort out their distribution. Mm. Um, you know, they've been uh, focused on direct store delivery for, for many, many years. And, and in its day, it was the right approach, but they didn't move the times to move to central distribution. And the situation we have now is we have duplicated costs. They're running a central distribution model as well as a direct store di distribution model. And um, they have to do that because they can't rely on central distribution alone right now. Um, but as soon as that comes on, on stream, there's a lot of other benefits that will come from that. You know, with the central distribution, you don't need warehousing space at your store, for instance. So a lot of the store space that's currently being uh, being used for warehousing space that they're paying retail rentals on can either be done away with or converted to shop front and increase your, 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 your store size. So um, a lot of the profitability you've, you've seen improvement coming through from the cost savings, mm. but I believe that sorting out the distribution is going to be the, uh, the really big carrot out there. And we're on our way to that, uh, to that target at the moment, you know, um, the golden sort of golden number you're looking for is about 80 to 85 percent of your store's supplies being supplied out of the central distribution warehouse. Um, and at the moment we are around about 50, 55 percent, so possibly a year or two to go. So Chris, I see you were nodding your head as Alec was going, so <laughs> you're clearly in agreement. This, if they get this distribution story right, pick and pay is, is, could be a really big player here. Yeah, um, no, Alec is, is quite right. And, uh, Look, they're Johnny, they're Johnny come lately is the way to describe it. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. But I think if you look at ShopRite, you look at Woolies and particularly Spar, that has been their forte. It has been centralised distribution. If you go back 15, 20 years ago, ShopRite were nowhere when it came to IT. And yet they took a view that they had to, to really get into this in a big way. 
So pick and pay have uh, they were out of it for a long time, but as, as Alex says, they're 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 clawing their way back. Ultimately, all of it comes back into the operating profit margin, and you know when they get uh, the improvement in, in the uh, central distribution side, it will improve their margins nicely. I mean, they're currently sitting at like what what one and a half percent or thereabouts. Two percent. Yes. It's 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 very poor. I mean, Shoprite's two three times that. So um, they've got a long way to go, and uh, the, in terms of, of bringing back customers. And that's different, again, from the, the whole uh, centralized distribution side. They've, they, they've probably got to do more and more on the loyalty card side, on the, the, the promotion side, to try and get that excitement, get the footfall through the doors and get, doesn't matter whether it's kids pestering the parents, it's all grist to the middle and it all works. Mm. Mm. Woolworths has done that very well in terms of the Woolworths loyalty card. Um, what is it that do you think that uh, Pick and Pay could learn uh, from the such retailers when it comes to still trying to, uh, to gain that market share? Well, look, uh, to gain the market share, um, Woolies has, uh, has done what any good retailer is supposed to do. They've had compelling, fresh offering in store. They have a very good shopping environment, shopping experience. Um, they're becoming more uh, compelling on the pricing. Um, and, and they have a lot of stores. So they've done all the right things, particularly now with their supermarket strategy, which is really gaining momentum. So. Marketing campaigns will help from time to time during the running of the campaign, as we see now with the stickies for pick and pay. Mm -hmm. But if the customer is drawn in by the campaign but is disappointed when he gets there because of poor on-shelf availability or poor offering, poor fresh or uh, uh, no innovation in foods, then you're going to lose that customer anyway. And that's exactly what Woolworths has been doing particularly well uh, recently. The other issue is that with the, cent uh, the central distribution, um, by not having central distribution, Pick and Pay hasn't been able to expand its convenience stores, a smaller format store, um, where that's, that's where the growth has been over the last 10 years in the, in the grocery space, has been on the convenience side, with more and more people working full-time, husband and wife working, smaller living units, not a big pantry anymore. You've had more frequent stops. Uh, to, to your supermarket to buy fresh stuff, to buy uh, smaller quantities. Mm -hmm. And without central distribution, pick and pay couldn't participate in that convenience market. Mm -hmm. So that's why they've been losing relative market share because the market's been growing, but they haven't been in on that growth. Mm -hmm. Chris, how does a pick and pay's African growth strategy compare to the likes of ShopRite <coughs> and Woolworths and all the other retailers? Are they just as aggressive? To me, it's a lot smaller. And one of the reasons it's a lot smaller is because for many years they were deflected, they were diverted into Australia. They went into um, Franklin's and that was an exercise in futility because they had to come limping back and, go and put a lot more resources back into the rest of Africa. Having said that, um, in Zambia they're doing quite nicely um, and they, they do have bigger plans for Africa. But again, they're jolly come lately. Yes, of course, they were in TM supermarkets now, which has re been rebranded in Zimbabwe. But, um, and they've been there for quite a long time. But in terms of the comparison with ShopRite and with MassMart, you know, they're, they're, they're not quite in, in, in the same space. I do believe that they're trying very, very hard, and that will be uh, a big growth area for them in the future. But again, they're coming from a low base. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alec, in terms of their, their strategy there, where can they still, you know, do you think that they can get this right in, in, in ensuring that they can make inroads into the rest of the African continent and, and mm -hmm. capture this opportunity? It'll come at quite a cost. You know, the advantage that ShopRite has on them at the moment is that over the last decade, almost two decades, they've been putting down infrastructure to distribute into, into Africa. So that's a massive, massive advantage. Pick and Pay doesn't have that distribution infrastructure into Africa. So arguably it's going to cost them a lot more to expand into Africa than it does ShopRite. Also, ShopRite has not been making it easy for them. Mm. Uh, knowing that MassMart is looking to get into that space and Pick and Pay, um, they've been opening stores left, right and centre. So they've got all the, making sure they've got all the good spaces. So it's going to be uh, an uphill battle for both Pick and Pay and MassMart for that matter to get into one, the lower income areas, and two, into Africa. What about the new player, uh, Choppies, uh, in Botswana, came South Africa. Uh, everybody seems to be raving about them. Where do they fall into this retail uh, space? 
they're a disruptive force and they're doing extremely well. Yeah. Um, as you say, Botswana based, they've got a few stores in Rustenburg and places like that. They recently bought, uh, what, for $10 million an operation in, in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So they understand the rest of Africa exquisitely. They're traders, they're operators. They really are very, very nimble. They've got a major price advantage. Not entirely sure how they do it, but mm -hmm. their prices are significantly cheaper uh, over a wide range of products than, than many of the, the players we, we refer to uh, right now. So I think if you understand the, the African space, which is quite different to the South African space in many, many ways. I think a lot of retailers make a big mistake by going in and thinking one size fits all. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I think Choppies, you know, they've had a bit of experience. They, they know what they're doing and they're, they're growing very aggressively. Mm -hmm. And if I can add to what yes. Chris said there, I think one of the other advantages that they have at the moment is that um, they uh, invested in central distribution and they already have a number of uh, uh, central warehouses in Africa and that makes a very very big difference. The other advantage they have is that they're quite small so from here it's going to be quite, it's going to be quite explosive growth that they can achieve by opening, by opening stores. I'm just wanting to understand the, the retail space. Is it just not very saturated uh, in different regions? Uh, there was a recent report that came out and it showed that in terms of retail potential, Gabon was sitting at number one, uh, Botswana was sitting at number two, and your usual suspects like your Nigeria and Kenya seem to be falling out of the top five. From a regional perspective, are we getting a sense that maybe it's easier to penetrate certain markets than others, Chris? Look, I don't know what the number of um, supermarkets is in the whole of Africa, but I remember speaking to Kuro Chihota about a couple of years ago, and, and he said there's only like 10 or 12. That's grown enormously since then. But given the size of the continent, given the number of people we're talking about, it's, there's still a huge um, way, way to go there. There are some major problems uh, that you have to surmount, not the least of which is land. I mean, the going rate for land, if you want to buy uh, a bit of virgin land in, in Africa and, 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 and put all your stuff on it, is going to cost you $4 million uh, uh, an, an acre. No one's going to pay for that. So getting land is excruciatingly difficult and excruciatingly expensive. So yes, there are some, are some hurdles built in. But I think even with some, some of the problems in places like Nigeria and Angola with the lower oil price and, and places like Zambia, which have got 10-hour uh, power outages a day, it doesn't matter. The longer-term prospect for Africa is still so compelling that even with all of those obstacles, um, uh, companies are, are going to go in there for the long term. Mm. Alec? Mm. I think, uh, I think uh, Chris is quite right. There is still quite a bit of opportunity. But I think you have to be quite a unique operator to uh, monetize that African opportunity, yeah. I believe. Um, you know, you need to be a bit of a wheeler dealer. Um, and I think ShopRite have done that quite well. I think uh, Choppies also understand the markets that they're in. Um, but for more formalized businesses, uh, it's, uh, it's going to be a bit of a learning curve. Mm. So uh, I think you, you'll still find some bruised knees in uh, retailers' experiences in Africa. Um, to come back to your satura uh, saturation point, I think in South Africa what we are seeing, um, while there is uh, still some growth, um, if you look at the real like-for-like -like volume growth of all of the retailers, you're starting to see more and more negatives coming in. So I think that um, in South Africa at least, particularly with the what appears to be structurally lower GDP mm. growth that we've been seeing over the last couple of years and, and lower consumption uh, generally, um, you are seeing signs that we are reaching that, that, that point. Mm. Uh, just before we wrap this up, uh, let's just um, make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of our, of our stock picks. So uh, pick <coughs> and pay, the outlook for pick and pay and also the outlook for the sector as a whole from South Africa and can move into other regions if you wish. I endorse fully what, what Alex said. I think we're, we're, we're going to experience some pretty low growth in South Africa for quite a few years to come. We're probably going to see austerity budgets for a while yet. One and a half to two percent growth. It's not conducive to that middle market. I'm not wildly optimistic about uh, pick and pay. I think Richard Brescia is doing a great job, um, but he's, he's got a lot of um, leeway to claw back. If I had to pick one stock, yeah. uh, undoubtedly it's Woolies. It's capturing the emerging middle class and it's also got um, Okay, it's not looking quite so good at this point in time with the, the Australian dollar because that's a bit of a commodity play. But nevertheless, it's still going to be stronger than the RAND. So, you know, I think they, they've played it extremely well on, on both fronts. So that would be my pick. Okay, Willis is your pick. Uh, let's get your pick, It's going to be very unexciting because I agree wholeheartedly with Chris. <laughs> do you? But you just said <laughs> that in, in, in they have to get their distribution centers right. Once they do, I mean, the long term, is that's maybe not the time to get into <coughs> pick and pay? It is. The, the, the issue with pick and pay is I'm not quite certain how, uh, how easily they're going to uh, get their lost market share back again. It may be too far gone. 
um, but also a lot of the upside because we're going to see fairly explosive growth in earnings over the next year or two as we get a lot of savings coming through and as that margin goes from 2% to 3 or 4% on that, that sales base, it makes a huge difference. Um, but a lot of that is already in the price. Mm, a lot of that already yes. in the price. So you both say all words. You're Very pick. much so. Not <laughs> pick and pay at this point. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, that's it for this week's edition of Fin Week Money Matters. Uh, remember that you can go and get yourself a copy of Fin Week. It's available uh, at your shelves at your nearest store, but also online. A big thank you to Chris Gilmore who joined us. He's, uh, he's a retail analyst from APSA Wealth and Investment Management. And also to Alec Abram, retail analyst at SASFIN Bank.